Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome from Mount Sinai Hospital, New York City. Uh, this morning at around 8.15, we welcome you for our monthly live broadcast of the peripheral intervention cases from our lab. I, Vishal Kapoor, my partner, Sandeep Singla, we welcome morning, you uh, to this uh, last uh, broadcast of the year. Uh, before I turn you to the lab, uh, just to remind you, any of our previous cases, you can go back, wa watch in the archive section from our website, ccclivecases.org. And uh, hopefully you're ready for this last case of the year. It's the most complex, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. PK, good morning. Good morning, Michelle, and um, I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties. You know, we've got a, a fantastic case here, which is really not, I would say, technically probably not difficult, but decision-wise, I think there's a lot of things to talk about. And I think, as you see, our, our, our broadcast in our, what is it, fifth or sixth year now, has really evolved into um, more of a decision-making and a multidisciplinary team. It, it's our pleasure this, this month to welcome Dr. Dan Hahn, who's, as you know, Dr. Tadros was here recently and Dr. Ferries was here recently. So we're really trying to incorporate everybody, um, our multidisciplinary team here at Sinai, into some of these more difficult cases to assist everybody at home in making decisions uh, real time. So I think this will be a great case. I'd like to first introduce everybody. To my right is my, my, my colleague, Dr. Dan Hahn, who's, who's an assistant professor of, of uh, surgery here at Mount Sinai and one of, the, one of our, our vascular surgeons who really assists us uh, tremendously in taking care of our patients in the cat lab. He, he's both proficient in endo as well as in surgical techniques, so he's perfect for this case. And he, I'm sure he faces these decisions in his practice every day. Welcome, Dan. Good morning. Uh, Thank you very much. And then we have uh, Ray Lascano, as all of you know. We have Merit Chu, who woke up early for this case. And then <laughs> we have <laughs> Damien outside. And then uh, Asma also, who's here uh, with us. So without further ado, I have a lot of things to talk in this case. I'm going to have Asma present the case, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get Dan's thoughts on it. Uh, good morning, everybody. So today we have a 66-year-old uh, male who, um, I'm sorry, I apologize for that type, but it's a 63-year-old male who has a history of smoking, non-insulin non dependent diabetes, CKD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He recently had a bypass surgery in November uh, and has a history of PAD, actually. Has, uh, he, he told us historically, we couldn't get the data on this, but he told us that they attempted to do a bypass on his left side and he also has a scar um, um, uh, you know on that side as well but but they say he said that the bypass so so let me interlude yeah. I spoke to yeah. uh, the surgeon uh, just yesterday so what happened was they they, they did a, a cut down in the common femoral they did a fem uh, to distal SFA bypass, I was telling Dr. Dr. Han, or by the proximal SFA, and you'll see during the lesions. And then at that stage, they were unable to, uh, the, the bypass, I believe, went down acutely within the hospitalization. Oh, wow. So they recut down, and then they tried to salvage the bypass. And at that stage, they were unable to cross into from the native SFA into the, uh, into the distal uh, 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 SFA, uh, uh, in, in, as well as you know, opening up the bypass also failed. All right, as, uh, so th that and, and he also has history of uh, stents in his right iliac and his right SFA um, uh, in 2010. So uh, he, he essentially presented with a history of uh, bilateral lower extremity claudication, which is somewhat acute in onset. He says it, it worsened after his bypass surgery. So the left side is, bothers him more than right side. He's hardly able to walk a block or so. And his uh, ABIs were done that showed, you know, on, on the right it was 0.88, on the left it was 0.92. And then he had a peripheral angiogram uh, uh, last month with us here that essentially showed that his... Uh, Is it the next slide or no? Th there, th of, the, of the... Of the angiogram? Uh, yes, there is. Go to yeah. next slide, please. Yeah. You know, before we look at this, it's always interesting. Whenever you hear about ABIs in these patients, we talk about 0 0.88 and 0 0.92. I was yeah, as a non-invasive study, there, it's kind of more of an indication that patients with CKD and diabetes will often have very calcified vessels. So, looking at the PVRs and the waveforms and kind of uh, linking that with your duplex ultrasound is much more important than just going with the ABI. 0 0.92 doesn't sound that bad, mm -hmm. but as we well, progress it's, in this case. Well, it's symptoms, and then you guys will see the angiogram. And, and I think that's also, Dan, maybe we could comment on the value of the TBIs. Obviously, this is For done sure. on the outside. We didn't have TBIs in mm -hmm. this case, but mm -hmm. this is something that I think is very important. But let's go to the angiogram. Yeah. So this is the uh, a still frame of the abdominal aortogram iliac angiogram. Uh, so essentially shows bilateral diffuse uh, ma moderate uh, iliac disease and there's a stent on the right which is which you can't appreciate the stent looked patent uh, next um, so this is a runoff of the left leg 
On the right side here, the ISR and CTO of the entire SFA, it reconstitutes in the P2 segment. On the left, you can, you can look at the angiogram. Um, so again. Uh, There'll be DSA images. Yeah, there's, yeah. Next, please. Doesn't show well. Oh, oh no, so no, so you didn't I do DSA. So okay. yeah, we, we did, but I it was uh, too. It, I didn't put it in here. Okay. But we, uh, yeah. So so essentially, what it is is uh, uh, he had uh, significant, very significant, uh, common femoral artery involvement on the left side, as well as profunda involvement, and an osteal, uh, osteal uh, CTO of the of the uh, of the you know flush occluded SFA on on the left side. All right, let's go live here. I want to I want to go over the angiogram here, so you 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 can see you can see here in the angiogram, um, you can see that the common femoral artery is diffusely diseased. You have a high takeoff uh, of the SFA, and on the, if you look at the scar, and uh, Dan didn't get a chance to look at the scar. It looks like it's right at the level of the of the femoral head, just below. He's going to walk around and take a peek at it, and 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 you can see that. Oh boy, it really draped them good. <laughs> so there you go. So, so you can you, you can see that that it, it probably I don't know what type of scar that is then probably again dartrectomy scar right yeah uh, they probably repaired it and then they did this <laughs> but but you can see here that the SFA uh, is right at at the level at the ostium it's a high takeoff it's an angulated takeoff so it's either a profunda that's more diseased than uh, than the common femoral at least angiographically because if you see the junction between the inferior epigastric and the takeoff of the SFA it, it clearly looks like the common femoral is diffuse but the endartrectomy seems to be okay but however the profunda has a critical stenosis which you'll see in a different view and I think that's what's really led to uh, his uh, his symptoms you've also have now have a, a, an occluded <coughs> uh, mid distal SFA uh, and then you can see in this view here there's another view of the profunda which becomes more robust and there's your SFA reconstitution right at that level and then you can see distally he was having and that's why I wanted her to show you the runoff earlier he actually had three vessel runoff and I, and I think because the profunda got worse you can see here that the runoff changes the, the anterior tibial artery is seen uh, approximately so is the, uh, the perineal and the tibial perineal trunk and the posterior tibial but when you start looking at it distally you see that this patient loses um, uh, a rapid flow in the anterior tibial artery, does have a robust posterior tibial coming down, uh, perineal also comes down, and then into the foot, you'll see very, very clearly that the posterior tibial seems to be the dominant vessel in the foot. So, so I, I was wondering you know, whether Dan could comment on utility, because obviously in this patient, he was very symptomatic, you know, just had an ABI workup. We had the surgical report. We got it late yesterday. The question would be, what would you think would be the the answer in terms of uh, the, the the non-invasive workup of such a patient? Utility of ABI TBIs and how do you use that in your practice? Yeah, no, absolutely. ABI PVRs and uh, ultrasound duplex are our go-to non-invasive studies to begin with for any patient. But ABIs in a lot of the patients that you're going to see in your practice, that PKCs in his practice, are not going to be accurate. Any calcified vessel will give you a falsely elevated ABI. The ultrasound, depending on your technician, might not give you the kind of best uh, imaging as well. TBIs have come a long way. So TBIs are a little bit better in terms of le being less affected by uh, calcified blood vessels in the ankle. So we actually use them very routinely. Uh, a lot of the patients that we see for CLI and CLTI, they, those are the patients that you really want the TBIs for. Now, sp skipping to this case, this case is a beautiful demonstration of why a profunda is one of our favorite vessels in vascular surgery, one of your, one of your favorite vessels in terms of symptomatic release. So you, you talk about the value of a profunda. So in a patient with a SFA CTO, the profunda collaterals are what fills the distal vessels. So when you guys do it here all the time, when you have a distal SFA occlusion and you shoot from the proximal SFA, the distal disease always looks so much worse. Mm -hmm. Versus if you're shooting from the common and you're, you have the profunda collaterals fill, you can really see what's dormant and what's there. Mm -hmm. This is a classic example of this, where now we have a profunda lesion that you guys didn't have before. So some of the distal, the AT might still be there. It might right. just be dormant that we're not seeing it anymore because the flow to the profunda has become so diminished. And for this patient with like life-limiting claudication, mm -hmm. borderline rest pain where they can barely walk a block, that profunda lesion is a real big player. So if you can fix the profunda flow, a lot of that symptoms might, you know, So, so, so Dan, I think as cardiologists, we face this a lot. I mean, you know, what, what happens is, you know, you, d you see the patient in clinic, you, you do endovascular cases, and, and you're like, okay, you know, this is a, a lesion, it was a claudicant, because he still is 
bordering rust paint, he could walk exactly, he says, about a block, a little less than a block. So he has, has no tissue loss. And, and you see this. And you know, the, 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 so the classic teaching, obviously this is a case who has a, a re-op groin, which I, I don't know what that means, and I'm gonna get to that. So the question is, how do you deal with a native uh, common femoral profunda disease in today's modern age of, uh, of, uh, of endovascular and surgical techniques? And, and uh, that's question number one. So let's, let's start with that. Say you have this as an isolated guy who's claudicating at a block who did not have a, a surgical groin and has this disease. Yeah. And, and I want everybody to see there's a better view of the profunda, and you can see that the profunda has a critical stenosis, and I just want to kind of go backward here, a critical stenosis at the level right there. You can see that. And it's you can almost see like 11. a totally occluded. Almost yeah, like probably a subtotal lesion. <laughs> probably that's the reason why he's been progressively getting worse, and we lost the, uh, the at least the flow in the anterior tibial artery. So for the view, I'm sorry, for the viewers who don't really do CTO speak, can you just define the SFA, the takeoff? Because, you know, there are so many yeah, so going so, on just so for you can see the SFA take off is the arching vessel I don't have a pointer unfortunately okay. the arching vessel uh, uh, coming off uh, as you can see there maybe uh, maybe you can uh, I don't know Ray can you yeah. go outside and just point point out the SFA so the so you can see that the the inferior epigastric lower border of the inferior epigastric is is the reflection of the SFA and, uh, and or, or, the, or the end of the uh, the uh, beginning of the common femoral, common femoral. The and then, the and then at, at that stage you could see for there's this short common femoral here because you have a high takeoff, at least looking at it, uh, SFA, and Ray's gonna put an arrow on it right there. Right. That's the SFA. And then right below that starts the profunda, and then the profunda has a very critical lesion with a big branch that comes off, and then the profunda runs below. Right. So, you know, the, so obviously the endarterectomy side probably looks pretty good here. We can IVIS it if you want. It looks pretty good. But the issue here is, you know, what, what do you fix? And that's why I asked Dan, if it's a native vessel, non non operated groin what does dan recommend yeah so common femoral you know uh common femoral artery treatment has been heavily debated recently yeah, i recently. think I, I think at your conference you had a beautiful kind of debate between dr zeller and, and dr, dr. Marin, Marin. which is very well <laughs> was received fun. and uh it's always very fun you know still if in our mind the gold standard for any kind of common femoral and profunda is still a open procedure yes the but the patency of a common femoral and profunda plat Common femoral endarterectomy with a profundoplasty is fantastic. And a lot of the time, in a virgin groin, you're able to do a very clean dissection, unless the patient's like obese with like factors that is gonna lead to them uh, with have compromised wound healing. It's a beautiful procedure that has fantastic patency. Now, in select patients who are re-op groins, redo groins, uh, obese with multiple history of wound, uh, wound infections in the past, uh, severely diabetic, active smokers, things that are gonna kinda compromise wound healing, or patients who've had multiple kind of cut downs in the past that makes dissection significantly difficult, I think common femoral uh, endovascular treatment does have a role in some of those patients as well. Um, but in the redo groin, well, how, does that, how does that change things? So the redo groin changes things a little bit. Uh, but Not a lot though. Not a lot, yeah. still, even so. There are, there are redo groins and there are redo groins in the same way that there are different levels of CTOs. Some of the redo groins are, is, are brutal. Uh, so, you know, there are patients that once in a while that we end up doing a dissection for where in a re-op groin to get proximal control, you end up going into the retroperitoneum because everything is scarred so in. So really, I think you take it by a case by case basis. So someone like this who's had a failed bypass, someone who's had like a bypass before that's not failed and has progression of the disease, I know we're treating him like a clodicin, but he's probably not like a clodicin. He's probably more Well, uh, he's truly very symptomatic. Yeah. Yeah, for but, sure. but the question, Dan, I think comes to like, like you know, if, if our, our, our audience outside lo looks at this, you know, and if, as a cardiologist or a radiologist, you look at it, and then, um, and then you see it. I mean, is a hybrid approach warranted? Because I'm going to have Asma go over the data in a second, but I think but when you and I can get started on this. So as a strategy, you have a redo groin, and you said that obviously he's not a very obese person. You can see here he's got good, good exposure, and I think you may be, you'll be able to get to it. So the issue is, would, would a hybrid procedure where we open the SFA, um, since the, the FEMPOP failed it, uh, percutaneously, if we can, and if we can't, uh, you know, and if we can, then stop there, send them to you for a profundo and a profundoplasty, uh, you know, uh, surgically. Would that give him the best long-term pain? See, he's relatively young. He does have some cardiac issues, but he'll be able to get through a surgery. And, and, and the issue will be, then we'll give him the option if the SFA intervention fails, that we have the durability of the profunda. Versus doing a DCB of the profunda, 
and then, you know, God forbid, dissecting it and then ending up stenting it and then going through that nonsense. Yeah, I think we had a discussion about this earlier as well. So whenever you guys get in your lab a patient who's had a failed bypass, bypasses fail for probably four yes. reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Some sort of inflow lesion problem, a problem with the conduit itself or a problem with the outflow, or the fourth factor is patient factors of hypercoagulability. So kind of whenever you get these patients who've had a failed bypass, investigation of that first thing is probably and This critical. guy has an inflow lesion. Absolutely, so I think you measure the pressure gradient across the external iliac and mm -hmm. the patient has a pr your gradient oh drop yeah, there. Oh yeah, 100, almost 60 millimeters, 80 millimeters. And then like another, like the patient had a SFA bypass uh, above the knee. That's so what he had. So looking at kind of outflow disease is also going to be very critical for this patient. So that's going to be first evaluation. Because even when we talk about doing a redo bypass, that's the same thing that we consider if we take this patient for a But here, procedure. here you would not need a redo bypass. Say we got through uh, with, the, with a endo procedure, yeah. and then you, you, here's your, your outflow, and say you decided to do a common, uh, a profundoplasty, because common femoral looks reasonable here. Right. So say, say you decided to do a profundoplasty. Is that, I mean, uh, is that the best approach, or, or do we do endo everything and not burn a bridge and see see whether we can uh, do this? Because as you know, the basal trial, I right. uh, clearly showed that pa patients who had endo first uh, had worse outcomes if they had surgery after the endo procedure. Yeah, so, so a profundoplasty often isn't just getting the profunda out. So okay. it, it means that we're dissecting out the common femoral artery, we're dissecting out the SFA and the, so, so profundoplasty is often just the extension of the incision you make to on top of the common femoral artery down onto the profunda. So th the dissection is pretty complete like you would do in a bypass. Gotcha. So we're not necessarily going into a virgin field even for that area. So okay. I do think it's worthwhile to try to do everything endo. Okay. So, so, th and I think, I think for the audience at home, I think it's important, with, uh, you know, when we have this discussion, I mean, if you're a surgeon, obviously you, uh, you're watching, you, you can go ahead and, you know, make that decision based on your experience. But I think having Dr. Han's experience uh, uh, with us and his thoughts helps. But I think it's important to get the, uh, the team involved. And I think you need a vascular team, you know? And that now in today's day and age consists of uh, a radiologist, a cardiologist, a vascular medicine person, and obviously a, a surgeon, a vascular surgeon, and, and or wound care if wound care is involved in this particular case. In this case, it's not. So um, I'm going to have Asma go ahead and start with the presentation, Vishal. And what we're going to do is, um, you know, Dan and I were talking about this. Dan wants to uh, 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 attempt the uh, profunda first, right? And, yes. And try to get through the profunda and then uh, maybe do a, a, a simple long, prolonged DCB at the level of the profunda, God willing, and not dissect it. And then, and then we're going to tackle the SFA. And for that, I don't know how that's going to go because we may have, uh, it's obviously a, a reattempt. So I don't know how that's going to go. We'll take a look. But go ahead, uh, Asma, why don't you go ahead and, pro and uh, start? Uh, all right. So, um, so that is our um, strategy. Right. So we have a seven French in, and you know, I'll, I'll discuss uh, the reasoning behind it. So go, go ahead, please. Go ahead, next slide, yeah. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a concomitant uh, CFA disease in the presence of uh, infraingulin disease and how that changes our strategy and why. So, so the reason the CFA yeah. disease yeah. is, uh, uh, it's, it's complex and it's uh, challenging to treat is because of the following reasons. So, so CFA is located at a high flexion point. Uh, the surgical patency of the, uh, you know, of the uh, endotrectomy is, is superb. So you know it's it's difficult to beat that, and it's usually a safe and easy surgical access, except when we talked about you know and redo groins. Sometimes that may be challenging, and uh, frequently it involves the femoral bifurcation, such as you can see as as a beautiful example in this case, and often the lesions are calcified, eccentric, uh, heavy plaques, and uh, you know and and the problem is that if we do need a stent, it is a crush prone zone. Um, and the other problem is that the f but if you if you end up stenting the area, the you know you you may need it for future surgical or endovascular access. Then you don't want to burn those bridges either. Next, so with that in mind, the CFA um, uh, surgical uh, you know the the, the thromboendotrectomy still continues to be the gold standard procedure uh, for yeah, for uh, for CFA disease. So essentially, you know, except for you know the, the limitations are it can you know it can the, the groin associated complications, especially if the patient is obese, has a redo groin just like we talked about. Usually, the coated morbidity of the procedure in in most of the trials is around uh, five percent. Would you agree? Uh, of a CFA endotrectomy. Uh, major hematoma wound, wound infection rates for sure. Major mm -hmm. hematoma shouldn't really be up that high, but I guess mm -hmm. everything considered I guess together. Cumulative? Yeah, five okay. percent. Uh, next, please. I'll take it. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, so, um, so this is uh, uh, I'll, uh, this is the you know. T uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. yeah. So this is in, in general. So this is a this is a paper. This is uh, from uh, it was published in uh, the Journal of Surgery. It was from uh, it was it, it's a it's a it's a essentially from uh, from Dr. Uh, Balata. And it was essentially this is a Kaplan Meier curve of uh, of of CFAs, and it's a eight, seven to eight year follow up. It essentially shows the the topmost line is the is of the little squ uh, the the squares is an assisted patency, and if you see the assisted patency of a endarterectomy <laughs> is hundred percent, which is great and difficult to beat. Then the second uh, second line, which is the little diamonds. Uh, is uh, the primary patency, which is again 96%, and that's that's pretty amazing itself. And then the third, the uh, you know the the freedom from revascularization is uh, you know it's 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 excellent for the first four to five years, and th then it drops to 79, 80%, which is still not bad. Next, please. 80% yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. So these are uh, like I was uh, I was talking about the coded complications. So this is the same paper from Dr. Uh, Bala uh, uh, Balota, and uh, uh, you know others as well. So uh, uh, the complication rate is anywhere from you know six percent to um, minor complications as high as eighteen percent. But those are mostly you know seromas, hematomas, you know wound infections, and and uh, and and such. So essentially, the rate of major complication, even at its highest at any paper, is around. 3.6 percent, which I guess shouldn't be in this day and age. Uh, next <coughs> so, talking a little bit about the uh, the the endovascular treatment of uh, CFA disease. Uh, so, if you if you go back, uh, can you go back two slides, please? Back, back, Th this slide. I want to I want to before I go on to the talking about the endovascular treatment about the CFA disease. I want to I want to uh, allude a little bit to this uh, classification, which was uh, published in. European Journal of Vascular Surgery. So essentially, they, uh, 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 Azima et al., they classified the CFA lesions as, as following. So type 1 lesion is the one that is located at the, uh, you know, it's in essentially in the uh, external iliac artery and uh, as it extends into the CFA. Type 2 lesions is, is a focal CFA disease, which doesn't involve, uh, you know, the uh, le uh, segment above or below. Type 3 are the lesions that are uh, involving the CFA and its bifurcation. Uh, and type 4 lesions are essentially, they represent restenotic bypass uh, anastomoses. Um, uh, uh, next, please. Next, next, next. OK. Uh, all right, so, so, the, so there's a lot of uh, data uh, that's come up in the last few years about the endovascular treatment of uh, CFA disease. And I want to uh, talk about a few important trials here. So this is a paper that was published in uh, Jack in 2011. So it's it's uh, from Germany, from uh, from um, uh, from uh, from Dr. Zeller's group. Essentially, uh, it's a it's it's their own experience of 360 consecutive procedures that they performed endo in uh, endo procedures that they performed in CFA. Next, please. So um, so the, so. Essentially, uh, there were uh, 321 patients who had 360 interventions. Uh, the exclusion criterion were, I just want to mention those because they did not, uh, you know, they did not include any, uh, you know, closure device associated uh, lesions or CFA thrombotic lesions and iatrogenic uh, CFA lesions. They excluded those. So this is, you know, pure atherosclerotic native disease, so to say. Um, so these are the, you know, so essentially th 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 these um, uh, were basically uh, out of these about um, uh, six 64, that is 17% or so were total occlusions of the CFA and about 30, 38, around 40% uh, involved the bifurcation. And they classified the bifurcation just like we do for the coronaries. They use the Medina classification of bifurcation. And um, um, so... Wow, nice. So sorry. Yeah, so uh, go next, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, next. OK, so essentially, uh, like I said, it was their local experience. And you know, there were 360 consecutive patients and uh, 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 you know, 300 and, uh, 320 uh, lesions that they treated. So their results, and they, they, they looked at the you know, one-year patency and, and TLR. And uh, 
essentially what it was that it's around 26% uh, of them, they, they received isolated CFA interventions and around 43% uh, and f uh, uh, you know had uh, and 42% respectively had concomitant inflow and outflow diseases so bifurcation lesions were present in around 40% like i like i said before and um, so so it's very interesting that the b that only balloon angioplasty alone uh, was performed uh, in in a very high number of cases uh, uh, around 98% and the stenting was only done for uh, bailout cases where they saw flow limiting dissections, and that was around 36% of the cases. So um, failure, as was defined by uh, angiographic residual stenosis, more than 30%. It was uh, it was observed in uh, uh, around uh, s uh, it was seen in around 7.2% of the cases. So. Uh, and any in-hospital major uh, outcome, a uh, major, uh, uh, you know, major um, outcome requiring surgery was, uh, and, and minor, for example, those that needed to be treated percutaneously or conservatively. So their complication rate they quoted, uh, the major was five, and minor was 18% of any of their um, endotreated CFA cases, respectively. <coughs> And then they had a, um, a, a one-year follow-up. They were they had a pretty actually I, I would say pretty um, you know robust patients uh, p population. They were able to follow up. They were it was around 90% of the patients they had in follow-up. And then they saw that uh, you know they they looked at the restenosis data uh, as as seen by duplex. Uh, anything more than 50%, uh, and that was observed. Uh, they said that uh, the you know uh, restenosis of more than 50% by duplex and TLR was observed in. 27 and 19 percent of patients respectively which is kind of still high as compared to what we just saw for um, you know for for in, for uh, endotrectomy um, next so um, this is the patient and uh, lesion characteristic uh, this is the patient and uh, sorry this is the clinical and procedural outcomes so like I said very high procedural success acutely 92 percent and uh, the TLR rates was uh, at one year was 19%. Then they divided into the patients who were treated percutaneously and surgically <coughs> for that for the you know target le uh, lesion revascularization. They need the surgical uh, treatment was in about 5% of the cases, and you know the five f uh, and the rest of them were basically treated percutaneously. Um, and uh, essentially, no, n in the in hospital death was uh, uh, just 1.2 percent, which is very low. And uh, one year amputation rate was just seen in one patient, and you know any late amputation was seen in two. But you know, obviously, not not as a uh, not uh, you know as it was basically a reflection of their inherent disease. Uh, next, so this is actually an interesting uh, slide, and I would like to bring to everybody's attention that they did this multivariate analysis to see what were the uh, predictors for adverse outcome for CFA endovascular interventions. So the presence of bifurcation lesion uh, and the uh, uh, bifurcation lesion was associated with, an, it was, it was associated with a negative, it, it was associated with essentially procedural failure and the odds ratio of that was you know, 2.71 with a p-value of 0 0.03 or 0.013. The, however, the, uh, the, the stent use was actually a positive factor for everything, for, for whether it was procedural failure, meaning that it prevented procedural failure. Stent use was also associated with less restenosis as well as less TLR, which is kind of very interesting. And um, the other, uh, other uh, factor that they noticed that was, uh, that was a predictor of TLR was associated infrainguinal disease. So essentially, three things to take home: that bifurcation and uh, bi you know involvement of the bifurcation and involve infranguinal uh, lesions are associated with you know worse outcomes, and stent use is actually associated with procedural success and with better TLR. Next, um, then this is another interesting study. It's based you know it, it came out of France, and uh, this was actually a, a, a randomized uh, study of. Um, around um, you know the, the around uh, a little over 100 patients 100 and 110 patients that they looked at uh, between 2011 to 2013 there was it, it was essentially a two year follow up of these patients who were equally distributed between uh, endo and surgical groups so the the primary outcome essentially they looked at was um, you know 30 day um, events but 
these people, they also followed about 86 of these 110 also were uh, followed for two, 24 months and uh, th two years that is, and they looked at primary patency as in TLRs uh, of, of these groups as well. And their, their actually, their data is very interesting. So they said that, uh, uh, go, go, to, go to next slide, please. Yeah, so they looked at uh, both modified intention to treat analysis as well as in per protocol analysis. They actually showed that, uh, wi which is you know kind of, uh, I'm a little baffled by this, but it showed that uh, at least in the first 30 days, they showed ba that the mortality and morbidity was way better for stenting, uh, I even if you take the intent to treat or per protocol analysis, it was very statistically significant for, for both cases and was in favor of stenting. And I think it, it alludes to the fact that the, you know, the acute complication rate of, you know, and mostly minor complications, I would say, of the you know, en endotrectomy in, in this day and age led to the differences in. It's a high mortality rate, you know, morbidi morbid morbidity, mortality rate at 30 days to 26% uh, to 16% 16 16 yeah. is high. We talked about how before all the mm -hmm. other literature mm -hmm. was around 5%. So mm -hmm. You know, it's something that needs to be looked at a little bit closely, but mm -hmm. it is a very high morbidity rate that we don't anticipate with the procedure. This is a European study, right? Yeah. This is France. France mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ne next, please. Um, so next, uh -huh. we talked about very high p-values. Next. Um, so this is uh, a good uh, slide that I wanted to talk about. And you know, of, of those things that they talked about, the morbidity and mortality, th what is very important is that there were zero deaths, no strokes, no MIs, no major amputations in either groups. So the, there were local hematomas, three local hem thro three hematomas, two lymph lymphoria, lymph leaks, and 10 delayed wound healings, and four paresthesias, and three local infections. So I think it's a little bit unfair to put all lump all of that as morbidity and mortality. I, I think I agree. The delayed yeah. wound healing, which is the biggest kind of mm -hmm. uh, contributor to the morbidity, is not something that ty people typically look at. Surgical site infections and surgical site complications is mm -hmm. one thing, but delayed wound healing, um, it <laughs> I guess, is kind of not a end parameter people typically put mm -hmm. in. Right, right, exactly. And that those were kind of the most, that was 10, not n of yeah. 10. Uh, next, please. And um, however, it's kind of reassuring to see that in this, the 24 month follow up of those uh, 86 something patients, that was very similar in both groups in terms of their survival, their patency at 24 months, hemodynamic improvement based on ABIs, and also freedom from TLR was very similar in both, both groups. And all, you know, all of them are, have, uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially the uh, same, th are, are pretty similar Look in both up. groups. So which is kind of reassuring <coughs> and it's uh, 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 next please in terms that endo treatment can be used as an option so this is another interesting study that uh, was presented recently <laughs> in uh, at viva in yes, 2018 so this year essentially was presented at viva so it, they they derived this study it was kind of uh, based out of the fact that the supera stent uh, i mean uh, i'm sorry that stenting was seen as a positive factor for both tlr and for uh, procedural success in, in the earlier study that yeah. we talked about uh, based out of Dr. Zeller's group. So they extrapolated it to see how Supera will do in that area because, you know, Supera is supposedly the, you know, the, 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 the you know, the mother stent of all the crush resistant stents. Uh, so uh, uh, next please. So this is, uh, next please. Yeah. So essentially they, um, you know, they looked at uh, 12 months primary patency as, as seen on Doppler uh, with a PVR of less than uh, P PSVR of less than 2.5, and they also looked at safety endpoints. You know, uh, procedural adverse outcomes up to 30 days post procedure, and their secondary endpoints, of course, were technical success, primary patency at six months, freedom from TLR at six and 12 months, and clinical success. Any uh, next, please. Um, so uh, they had, uh, you know, uh, inclusion was they had rather for two to four uh, uh, versus they excluded anyone who was five or more. So essentially, just for Claudekin's study. So any de novo and post uh, POBA lesions they, that were okay to use, stenosis of more than 50% were included, and uh, um, and um, uh, and they should have a good uh, d distal runoff as well. Um, uh, and it's if th and they should have a d they should have had a patent, uh, you know, profunda. And if somebody had a occluded um, distal, uh, uh, I mean, deep prof d deep femoral and superficial, those were excluded. Next. 
And uh, just a quick look at their lesion characteristics. Their mean lesion length was around, uh, you know, 4.4, uh, uh, 44 uh, millimeters. Uh, and then, um, you know, reference vessels were around 7, 7 to 7.5. And occlusions were present in 11%. Um, and the degree of stenosis were around 80%. And then uh, if you remember that, th th that classification that we talked about earlier, most of them fell in azema 2 and 3, so meaning that either they were isolated CFA lesions or they were CFA lesions involving the bifurcation as well. Next. So um, uh, this is, uh, th they, you know, they're just showing that they most of the balloons they used were around 7, and they most of the people received one stent, 98 of them received one stent, and only two, uh, uh, two received two stents. And the stent mean stent diameter was around six, uh, six point five. You know, basically f five to five to eight millimeters uh, superiors. Next, and uh, this is uh, this is essentially a uh, uh, you know, around a year of, of follow up, uh, two hundred and ten days. So this showed a very excellent primary patency of uh, uh, of hundred percent, which this is, is one year follow up, right? Yes. One year follow up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they said 210 days, so yeah, basically okay. one year, yeah. So uh, it uh, was great, 100% uh, primary patency, next. And freedom from TLR was essentially 100% as well. So, so, so for short term, at least, you know, for that one year period, Super did very good, sure excellent, enough, next. Here. And this is also <coughs> another study that I would uh, briefly like to talk about. It was es essentially a literature review, and it was uh, published in Vascular and Endovascular Surgery in 2017. So it was a systematic, uh, you know, it was a systematic review and uh, essentially uh, looked at both studies um, looking at uh, endotrectomy and um, endovascular studies. So seven endotrectomy studies and four uh, endovascular studies were included. Next, this is the studies that were included and the number of patients and mean follow-up uh, of, of those patients. Uh, it's quite heterogeneous, but you know, um, uh, yeah, weird, right? a decent number of studies. Next. I just will hold the catheter. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, and, and then you know, this 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 is a little bit you know overview of what all the studies are showing that uh, the the first uh, seven of them are CFA tri CFE trials, femoral endotrectomy trials, and you know pretty good survival I would say, and primary patency of the order of which we already talked about ninety four to even hundred uh, hundred percent in one study. Uh, I guess that's probably assisted primary patency at <coughs> at six uh, uh, at, at 12 months to as as much as 84 months uh, was the highest uh, follow up, and then the endovascular trials they were essentially um, you know very good survival as well and they showed uh, like like we uh, like we talked about before around s seven so so the lowest was in this study in uh, you know Soga's group it was. Uh, it was 47% uh, at uh, 60 months, and you know, but the short term around one year, it, it looks it looks pretty decent, like 74% to 80% uh, uh, primary patency and freedom from TLR. Likewise, is around 60%, and uh, freedom from amputations is very high, which we should not expect because most of these are taking Clodican, so so 99% at um, at 12 to 24 months. Uh, next. So, uh, so essentially, in conclusion, you know, basically, what what it is is that uh, uh, I just wanted, you know, to uh, 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 take a minute to uh, to you know to wrap up that. Uh, so, endovascular interventions overall have a you know low rate of complications. Have now with the current uh, tech technic you know techniques and the new devices have a relatively high uh, rate of uh, technical success. Also, have a good short term patency. But obviously, there's an increased need, as we saw, of repeat interventions as compared to the surgical procedures. So surgical s procedures will therefore, you know, still continue to be the gold standard because the, because the, you know, the 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 the, the beautiful um, uh, uh, freedom from TLR and primary patency as much as around uh, up to about eight years that we see uh, that we have seen now. And you know, only notwithstanding the fact that obviously the the immediate morbidity and Mortality short term uh, within 30 days may be slightly uh, obviously higher than uh, the uh, endovascular techniques. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. all I have. Thank you. That's an incredible review. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's absolutely a lot of hard work goes into that. Yeah, no, fantastic. You know, but the question here is, uh, you know, in terms of, in terms of what we're going to do here. Let me just show you uh, what we've done. So, so first before that, let, let's take let's take uh, your take on this. So obviously, Canberra's data. I mean, everybody knows it. We talk about it all the time. 
Dr. Cambria did uh, the landmark study that I think you went over, I couldn't hear because we're concentrating here, that looked at uh, the patencies of endotractomies and you know how good, how good it is. But now with, with the advent of better stents, the advent of drug-coated balloon technology, um, you know, can you say, I mean, um, are, are you feeling comfortable, especially now you have a randomized control trial with TICO, we know we talked about some of the data that may not make sense in, in terms of historical complications with surgery, but still the stents did pretty damn good, right? That's absolutely true, and so, I think- So where do you think it fits in, in today's uh, area? So I think it will eventually get there, but I do think that we still have limitations in our uh, technology at the moment, and these are kind of the reasons for it. So if you look at Dr. Zeller's study, the need for a bailout stent was in a third of the cases. Yes. About 33% of the cases, plain angioplasty alone didn't really work, and you had to put a stent in that area, um, which is a very high bailout rate. And one of the things that we don't talk about when you put a bailout stent is that the profunda is right there. And oftentimes, we're, you can see our discussion for even this case, the value of a profunda is very high, and if you lose a profunda or jail out the profunda with the stent, it could be really, really a uh, problem for the patient going forward. So I think that's one thing to really consider. The second, Agreed. When when there's a role for stenting in this region, Supera is going to be the stent. Um, you agree with that? I do agree with that. Mainly because you, we've seen the data in like the areas that are behind this behind the knee. It does have good uh, crush resistance and torsion. But with a caveat, when, when whenever we deploy Supera, and I'm sure you guys have had Supera cases during this time, the yeah. biggest phrases vessel prep right and when we think about getting the vessel to its native diameter before you deploy it so that you can allow for a long-term patency well the other thing also common femoral patencies are obviously greater than the the the, the larger superas so now they have larger superas available in europe they have the 70 superas available which we don't have here in the u.s so in most of um, uh, cohen's cases he used seven the bigger superas, ones right? he used larger ones yeah. as far as i remember 6.5 6.5 and above was a mean length yeah so then you have obviously a mean diameter then you have other ones so so that's another issue yeah so it's but, something but the consider. issue is with the profunda he looked at the patencies of the profunda on the on the on the cases that the profunda was involved right no, I know. I I saw the presentation of Eve. I was on, I was on mm -hmm. one of the uh, people there, and I, I could tell that uh, what what they looked at was patent or not patent. They right. didn't look at stenosis. Right. So if there was profunda flow, they considered a patent. If there was no profunda flow, they considered not patent. It was actually an like exclusion, and, and the one of the exclusions was uh, if the profunda was occluded, they were excluded. Right, but but they they did stand across the profunda in these cases. In a yeah. certain in, number in a of these cases. Number, yes. yeah. And in those, they looked at the flow and the profunda was patent. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what value that is, but again, in this case, as you can see, the profunda is incredibly valuable. But Dan, I, I, I think I want to bring up a couple of points that One you One last did. point before sure. we go there. So the last thing to consider is what the surgical option and the surgical bailout after stenting right. is. So if we think about a stent across the common femoral, now when we do a dissection for that common femoral artery, the dissection is no longer limited to the groin. You're going into the retroperitoneum to get control at the external iliac artery. Because uh, you, either that or you're crushing across the stent and then trying to bail out the stent and pull the stent out of the artery. So if you want to, it does make the surgery oftentimes a lot bigger by having the stent in that groin region. So it's one last thing to consider. Well, you know, and, but what they did comment that the, uh, if all the stents, the supera may be the easiest to pull out. It is the easiest That's to what pull they out. said. Um, I mean, I'm not a surgeon, so that's what they <laughs> talked about. But, you know, I think those are all great points. But I think here, you can see here the value of the profunda. You can see we had difficulty crossing it while, while Asma was talking and teaching. And what, what we felt was that we were able to cross finally with a confianza, so it was an occluded vessel um, or a win. I don't know which wire we use. And you can see here with just a super core wire down, you can see here that you have a uh, no flow in the profunda. Mm -hmm. So Dan and I discussed offline, because we didn't want to interrupt the presentation, about the role of atherectomy. And Dan and I agree, kind of agree that this is kind of a no man's zone for atherectomy. We don't know, although it's probably not unreasonable to do it. We decided just to do a DCB balloon angioplasty. So we eyeball sized it at a four, and you can see here, it was very tough to get the DCB through that. And you can see here, there's the uh, DCB going up, and you can see it's a very tight stenosis. So we inflated for four minutes um, uh, with the DCB. And, uh, and then you can see here, after DCB, there was a slight non-flow limiting dissection at the level of that stenosis with moderate disease distal. Uh, one of the interesting things that PK did uh, before we even put up the balloon was that with the catheter across the sleeve, and he shot the, he shot the distal outflow. Right. To see whether or not oh, this yeah, profunda yeah. was exactly. going to have a yeah, value. Let me go back and show you that. Oh, wow. So we, we got across the lesion with difficulty, as Dan was saying, and you can see the difference in the outflow. See, though, so this is us getting, well, going through the lesion here, showing you the tightness of that profunda right there. So it's, it's occluded, basically. And then over here, we got, we got across the lesion, took a shot distal, and th this is your outflow now. 
shooting through the Profunda. And you can see what an important role the Profunda plays with no SFA flow in terms of filling your distal vessel. You can see the anterior tibial is actually more robust than it was through the uh, common femoral external iliac picture that we had. So now if we had shot through this Profunda and saw absolutely no difference, then you wonder whether or not it's worthwhile to treat. But with seeing that there's increased outflow here where you're seeing those kind of dormant vessels fill again, we definitely thought this was going to be important. Exactly. So, so the question here, Dan, is now you, we talked about bailout standing rates being 30%, right? Yeah. So Vishal, in this Let kind of dissection in Sandeep, what do you guys do? I mean, when you see this kind of dissection post-DCB, and that's kind of the question I have here. This is post-DCB angioplasty. You have this kind of uh, dissection, non-flow limiting, obviously. Uh, there's a moderate stenosis, I'm not going to chase it. The question is, what, I mean, would you guys place a stand, not place a stand? What's your thoughts? No, I mean, I, if you're doing purely profunda plasty, then I would probably avoid not putting a stent in if I don't have to. So probably do a low, prolonged, low inflation balloon to see how it responds. Sometimes you can just stack up the dissection wall and be good with it and just get away with stenting. Worst case scenario, if you have to stent, but that's our strategy. But I'm going to go back once Sandeep answers. I just have a quick question for you, but Sandeep. No, but I agree. And there's a recent uh, paper, you know, it's a meta-analysis. Uh, it's a non-controlled uh, trial uh, in JVET in 2018, where they did a very prolonged inflation versus a standard three-minute inflation. They went up to inflation times of five to ten minutes. And uh, the difference in potency was, the immediate potency was uh, statistically significant. So I think I agree with Vishal. You know, we don't know the stent outcomes in Profunda. I would definitely shy away from that. And uh, I would, if we have to do, this looks like a non-flow limiting, but if, let's just for the devil's advocate, if there was a more flow limitation, I would try a prolonged balloon inflation and then go from there on. I would really, I really don't want to stent a profunda. Yeah. So PK, let me ask you this. Why do we not, like just being the other way around, why don't we, why would we not attempt the SFA lesion first, try to cross? If we cross, we have a straight inline flow and are all good. If we fail on the SFA, then start fixing the profunda. Because what will happen now is if you fix the profunda before, and like you said, if you end up in trouble by having a flow limiting dissection and stenting, now neither we have a flow down the SFA, and now our profunda is jeopardized. So it's like a double whammy. So Would you not want to go in the SFA first, try to fix it, and then as a bailout do profunda plasty? It's a great point. I mean, I mean, from my perspective, uh, I mean, again, this is just like Dan and I actually spoke about it prior to us talking, is what percentage of SFAs are we really failing? I mean, very, very low. And I think that's a great point in your experience uh, you know, level. I think Dan and I feel that, I mean, I've got luxury of having Dan here. If I couldn't get distal access, he could do a cut down for me, and we can get distal access, and we can fix it either retrograde, integrate with CART technique, whatever technique we could do. So we felt confident we could get through this SFA. The, I think the idea here of opening the Profunda was, was, was trying to, you know, why is this guy in rest pain and how can we improve the patency of the SFA? To me, you know, if, if, we, if we get as much flow down to that distal vessel as possible, I think, I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile. And second, I think this Profunda is going to occlude. I really believe it because just in the last month since we did the diagnostic angiogram, it has progressed. And we have pictures, I know Asma didn't show it to you, but we have pictures to show to you that that, that was actually much better looking than it looked now. So part of the reason is I think we, we use a drug coated balloon, open it, but I think honestly, it's a very reasonable statement what you said, but I think it depends on your level of experience. Dan, your thoughts? And yeah. that's why I said the level of experience, I was very surprised. I'm like, PK can get through that SFA like quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, Vishal, absolutely fantastic point. So we talked about what has progressed, because you know we talked about how after the bypass, and after the bypass failed, this patient's symptoms got a lot worse. So what's changed? And it the only like thing that's uh, really changed off. from before the bypass to afterwards mm -hmm. is that the profunda has become a little bit tighter in lesion. Sure. So when we talk about, you know, doing the least amount of things for this patient, we even talked about whether or not we should even stop at this point. Exactly. You know, like after we did the balloon angioplasty of the profunda, we shot the outflow and the patient's been restored to what they were before the actual uh, bypass when the symptoms got acutely worse. So if we had stopped at this point, the patient's symptoms of like one block caucasia might actually be kind of relieved here. Um, but you know, like we talked about, you know, rate of crossing for these CTOs with you guys over here is like close to 100% at this point. So 
at any point they felt fairly comfortable that we could come back and try to open up this uh, SFA. Yeah. But yeah, no, your your question is so, totally valid. See, look at that, BK, crossing like a swift, well, smooth Well, you butter. know, I, I, I think a lot of it is, <laughs> I, I got to be honest with you, a lot of it was very tricky. And I want to go, Dan and I would actually no, go, my, we, we, we were talking about it offline because if you saw this SFA, and I think that's the value of really taking angiograms and being, right. but, you, know, co you know, collaborative and looking at it. So you see this SFA, you know, uh, where's the final? Yeah, this is a good picture. Nope, next one. Yeah. So you can see this SFA. So, you know, we don't know if it's a native vessel or a graft. I don't know if that proximal is the graft and then connecting to the native vessel there. I don't know if that's what they did. I'm not sure what they did. You know, it's very hard to tell. And I don't think there's anything wrong. I mean, they, they probably the SFA might have been open and then acutely went down. Who knows? So we felt getting into that, we needed an angle catheter. We got an angle catheter in and then we got to that, that robust, like almost like a, a dilated zone in that, what, that vessel uh, proximal and then it narrows down. And at that level, we went ahead and took another picture. Um, sorry, I got to go forward here. And here, so we got, we got into that, and that's where the value of an angle catheter helps. And then we took another picture here, and then we switched to a glide wire just to show. And then we took another shot here. And this shot is important because you need to see where the vessel is. And Dan and I were saying, well, that looks like the native because you've got a branch coming off. And Dan, felt, Dan and I felt pretty confident that that was a native. However, you can see that area of tram track calcification. So the idea would be to use that angle catheter to point towards the trans trap calcification and then use a glide wire to break the cap, which is what we did here. And then, and then here, see here again, you can see here how that right. branch comes off and then you have that trans trap calcification to give you an idea. And then we went ahead, formed the loop in the glide. You can see the glide is now inside that calcification area. Then, then we formed the loop and then, and then we basically took the loop down uh, to this level. Now you could say, well, PK, why aren't you interluminal, extraluminal? And I don't really know whether that really makes a difference. I don't know. Dan, what do you think about interluminal versus, um, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, uh, subinterval angioplasty in these kind of cases? Uh, I think in these kind of cases, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. Uh, depends what you're going to follow up with the PK. What's your uh, go-to Well, the, Well, first, I think that I'm questioning where I am now, a little die now, just to see where we are. I mean, yeah, I mean obviously, the loop... The loop has it's to right be there. Right on top. So we're close. I mean, the loop has to be very small. The loop is too big here. So I'm probably going to switch out to a. Uh, we looks like, no, we didn't cross. Yeah, yeah we didn't. Yeah, cross. We, looks like we crossed. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead, a little die, just to make sure. Right. I, I, I think the issue here is just sort of make sure that we're in the true lumen here, and we certainly seem to be. Maybe not. Maybe yeah. loop. that's the hood right there, Dan. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you that's, the hood. that's the hood. Yep. Yeah, the, that's the hood. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, the reason is mainly for the audience to learn that. You know, you can do profundoplasty, but you have to understand that okay. this case can quickly turn to an acute limb ischemia as well if you lose Very your profunda so. and your SFA. So if you're an experienced hands like PK and Dan, you can get out and be happy. But for the audience, if you haven't done a lot of profundoplasty, you probably take a seat back, reassess, reevaluate, and then do it. So, so now, now we're through. Okay. Now, I mean, let's talk a little <coughs> bit about treating now. You know, like, now, Vishal, one of the things Dan and I spoke about is let's pull the wire out of the profunda. And let's see how this profunda reacts over the next, next 30 minutes while we fix this lesion. So the issue now becomes is, you know, if that profunda significantly recoil or the flow looks like poop when we're done, then, then we might have to talk about other techniques of either, no, I already took a picture, uh, other techniques of either, you know, you know uh, prolonged balloon angioplasty or possibly, you know, the S word, uh, <laughs> you know, which we don't want to talk about. But first, let's talk about this long segment SFA. So here's a guy, obviously, you know, he becomes symptomatic. We fix the profunda. I mean, what do you guys think in terms of uh, fixing this lesion in the modern day and age? I mean, we've got DCBs, we've got DESs, we've got, you know, we got, we got the gamut. What do you think, Dan? How would you do it? Uh, I'm a big believer of kind of debulk and then DCB. Okay. Uh, that's always been kind of like my case yeah, and try to try to limit the amount of stents I put in, in these patients because mm -hmm. once you put it in the stent, that's the maximum diameter you're going to have for that vessel. I definitely use it as a bailout kind of strategy. So atherectomy has been, atherectomy DCB has been my go-to for any you, CTO. Now you, you prefer rotational, directional, what do you like better? It in these kind of, especially in a CTO. Yeah. Uh, so for the long segment CTOs, I do like rotational, but you know, I've had a couple instances recently where the wire gets stuck on the actual machine. Right. Um, in terms of debulking, I'm a big fan of directional atherectomy. I think what it does a good job of taking so, it out as much so as possible. So, if I can play devil's advocate, and sure. I think I want to ask this to Vishal and Sandeep. So, Sandeep and Vishal, if you, if you look at the impact long data, right? And now they recently, I, I actually presented the impact very long data in Viva, where, where you had lesions out to almost, you know, 30 uh, centimeters, uh, which, which, which looked 
fantastic. I mean, your TLR right. rates were in the in the 10 percent at uh, you know in, in, at uh, at the two years, and basically you know we're we're really really doing well. So my question is why why debulk? I mean, um, you know, I, I believe, as everybody, in, I think, in, the, in this audience knows, I love debulking. But the <laughs> point is, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Why debulk here? Does it add anything additional to, our, to us, or, does it not, or, or is it, are we just wasting uh, time here? That's a good point. I mean, I don't have, like, long-term data to support it. It's just kind of <laughs> preference and choice and my own anecdotal experience. Sure. With it. But if you look at the randomized trials, Dan, I mean, if you look at now, Vishal, uh, Vishal can you quote no, that, uh, the Boston trial with a long lesion, right? They had a long lesion subset at one year. The, uh, the uh, what is that uh, stent that just came out? Illuvia. Illuvia. Right, I mean, same thing. I mean, for me, directional, I mean, doing atherectomy here is more about vessel preparation. Like Dan said, there is no long-term data to really support one or the other. It's mainly a definite LE, which was a trial for this directional atherectomy, which was done in cases comparing with PTA. But essentially talking about atherectomy per se, yeah. it's more of an experience and the usage we really we come out to be, and especially in calcified lesions. Mm -hmm. Now here somebody could argue you're subintimal, you're away from calcification, unless it's a medial calcification, you would do it. But I would probably take the same strategy as hand, do an atherectomy, do DCB, and do focal uh, directed stenting if need be. Well, well, okay. Let, uh, let me play double uh, double devil's advocate oh here. Oh my lord! I went You're sub a devil today. I, uh, yeah, I went subintimal to cross. All right, so I'm sub I didn't want to waste time because I know our, our friends who did this are very good operators, and I know they tried. So the point is, let's get through this, let's cross this. So the issue is, I crossed it sub I've created a massive dissection plane. Am I going to not stent this at the end? So why not cut to the chase and just use uh, Illuvia or Zilver up and down and be done? Or, or put a coverage stent? I think especially when you cross up into more directional atherectomy is the go-to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can definitely direct it towards your sub plane with the. Uh, but you feel you comfortable not standing it. Yeah, I do. Okay, actually, me too. Yeah. That's why yeah. I'm just I'm good. because I think a lot of people definitely. are making trepidation, Dan. You yeah. know, they're like, oh my God, I went sub You know, am I going to have to stent it? You know, if I'm going to stent it anyway, why am I using atherectomy? Sure, sure. Let me just cut to the chase and be done with the case. You know, but I, I agree with you. Now, PK, let me ask you, and then it's, uh, Sandeep and Vishal, let me ask you too. Thanks, too. Basil three. And the pause on mm -hmm. the DCPs because yes. of mortality data. <laughs> I think it's probably perfect time to talk about yes, it. Yes, that was just a great segue. I love Why it. Why don't we ask the devil there right there? <laughs> 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 well, you know, you know, I'm, I'm waiting on, on Sandeep. I know Sandeep has been giving a lot of thought on this one. So, Sandeep, I know, I know you love this. Uh, we talked about it yesterday. And you were teasing me that I was, being, um, I was being facetious in my comments. So tell me what your thoughts are on this, Sandeep. No, so, you know, I haven't read that paper, but... Uh, there is this meta-analysis which shows increased mortality uh, with the use that. of petrotexel <laughs> uh, drug. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of talk about it, but, you know, we'll have to see what actually contributed to mortality. You know, I, my, one of the thought I had okay. was when they used DCB, even though in a randomized fashion, you know, we tend to give antiplatelets for a longer duration. And uh, is it like, you know, was the uh, mortality related to use uh, increased bleeding episodes? And there is, you know, there is some retrospective uh, data when they use antiplatelets, the chance of diagnosing cancers goes up. And that the thought behind it is that the occult bleeds, which are uh, mucosal cancer related, they tend to get diagnosed more. So uh, I honestly, you know, uh, my perception is that we'll have to analyze why the mortality, overall mortality was higher with the use of DCB. I will not jump to the conclusion of not using it, especially with the impact five-year data supporting a good potency. And I totally agree with uh, Dan, you know, when he says that I don't like putting stents in and limiting my future therapy. I, um, I kind of agree with the, you know, a DCB uh, preceded by atherectomy as needed and using stent as a bailout. So I would still no, stick to the uh, pectodexal based therapy and uh, go from there on. I would wait for uh, further analysis of this data. Well, I no, think, I, uh, uh, go ahead, Vishal. No, 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 I, no, 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 you I, I agree with uh, him. I mean, it's a very important finding, very important to look at. I mean, especially when they follow for five years by doing regression analysis, the number needed to harm is almost like 14. It was 25 at three years and 14 at five years, which is very impressive, even though the number of randomized trials which were taken into consideration went down from like 15 down almost to three, but it's a very important point to consider and take care of and take a step back and reevaluate the whole process of doing paclitaxel. So, I mean, it's something, uh, a, a big development, good or bad, mostly bad right now to see what happens, so we'll see. 
So when you do direction atherectomy, the first thing you want to do is run it down, almost daughter it, get it all the way distal to see how it feels. You, you don't, you're, you're going to have a lot of bias here because of the curvature of the vessel. So you need to cut appropriately. So I'm going to start a little bit lower than I normally would. You can see the toggle of this vessel, uh, this device is very aggressive. And the device is very aggressive, but it still doesn't mean that, that your technique is any different on. So you just want to go very, very slowly, right? Really just kind of push it down. I mean, you know, this is one of those things you, where, where you, you may perforate, but you need to be aware of it. So you need to listen to obviously both your, uh, yep, off now. Okay. You need to listen to both your sound, go down, as well as your, uh, your movement of the, of the device. Off, okay, come back up. So I, I usually in these CTOs do two cuts and I'm gonna do a, a, a lateral and a medial cut and then take a picture and then decide if I need to cut more. I think it's reasonable to be more conservative here on. You can see, see, that, see that toggle, see that aggressive cut off, and you see how it rotates. Is he feeling something, guys? He just moved. You have to be very careful when they move and stuff like that as you're doing these kind of atherectomies because you can easily, easily perf. And also, my, my sheath is way up in the iliac. It's also worrisome because of that gradient, so you've got to be careful as you to go head on. With this device, you can see how aggressive that is. This is really an aggressive cut. That's right there across. It is right it's there. very aggressive. Off here. So you can see I, I keep adjusting my, my, uh, my device to make sure I don't cut in the same plane uh, because obviously I'm sub interval to begin with on. And I think this is kind of the technique that you want to point your, your cutter towards the lesion off. So you can see again it rotated. And, and this is going to be very common occurring when, when, when you do these kind of cuts because the, device, the, the vessel itself is very tortuous and because of that your your your, your um, device is also going to move off yeah so we're going to take it out here i'm going to take a quick dsa always be you know checking your sheet somebody fix my sheet please also worry about wire wrap because i rotated so much you know so wire wrap can occur pressures are okay ready inject Beautiful. So much better flow down. Okay. You can see the hood of the graphic. I, I avoided cutting across that. I don't know what Dan. How do you deal with it when you have a hood of a graft? Do you cut across that yourself? No, I definitely don't. Same yeah, for the too. same exact reason. I mean, you're you're going to be cutting into su a suture line there. Yeah. So definitely avoiding it is going to be important. And then the location of the filter here. I know um, for the directional atherectomy, you always need it to be a little bit further push. away. Uh, so uh, the uh, atherectomy devices often have a nose cone that's anywhere between uh, five centimeters mm -hmm. to nine centimeters long, depending on the device you choose. So you want to make sure that your filter is down far enough from your lesion so you can pass your device all the way to one. I don't know if you guys are looking at the Profundo flow yes. now. Yeah. How interesting is that, huh? So what do you think is happening? There's another. I don't think there's any dissection or recall. I think you just have preferential flow through the SFA yes, at this absolutely. stage. Exactly. Absolutely. And I think that's what's happening. You're, yeah. you're getting better flow through the SFA. And I think over time, the Profundo will dilate again, and you'll be able to see that. I think that's a f that, uh, exactly to PK's point. That was a Profundo that was on its way out. You know, it, it's the patient had come in with significantly decreased flow on the bottom side of it, on the outflow of it, because the Profundo flow was so compromised. So. So say that our SFA lesion that we're treating right now ends up failing for whatever reason, we do still have a backup that the Profunda is now painting. So now we're gonna do a quick IVIS. And Dan, how do you size your DCBs? As you know, you know, I know we do a lot of IVIS in a lab for multiple reasons, but uh, you know, a lot of it research-wise. But the question is, why do you, uh, how do you guys size? As you know, the Lutonix data was very clear telling us that uh, the, uh, you know, if you're not one-to-one, a one point one to one you may have, uh, you may have mag up, please, on the, on the oh yeah, there it is, I can see it now, no problem. 1.1 one, 1 .1 to 1, uh, you may have high restenosis rates. Do you guys just eyeball it? Do you IVIS it? Do you Q, QVA it? What do you do? It, it depends on the case, but I, you know, IVIS definitely would be the gold standard. If we could have do it in every case, we would, but a lot of the times we don't. Uh, in those other kind of cases, one of the things I like to do That's after a uh, directional atherectomy or any kind of atherectomy is a poor man IVIS, which is a, just like a low pressure uh, balloon that I put up. Right. Um, and then with low pressure that doesn't even go up to nominal, I can see whether or not there's right. residual areas I need to cut. But in addition to that, it gives me a kind of ballpark there idea of getting a size. There is a There's a dissection there. Yep. But we're pretty illuminal. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple of veins there. I'm not worried there. Looks like we're yeah. pretty illuminal. Yeah. I'm surprised. 
Yeah. Ah, there's a dissection. Yep. So we got some areas of dissection. Majority Still is pretty good. Them. Yeah, that's a bad dissection there. The question is, what size is this vessel? In terms of six, IVUS. Six. Six. Oh. Six. Oh. So give us uh, one of the six oh two fifty impacts. <coughs> 60250 impact balloon, please. So, so the we now I don't know if everybody has them on the outside. We have these large impact balloons that are available, which make our life easy. So the question is, will it cross this lesion? I don't know. With this, it's such a truck, you know. And so one of the other things to consider is now, as of I think yesterday, Lutonix 018 gained FDA approval. Right. So mm -hmm. we don't have it yet, though. Yeah. So we don't have it yet, but like a lot of the times when you have a filter wire, that's 01 weight wire. Yeah, might, you know, it's perfect time because a lot of the times switching over to an 035 balloon has the little step off. So this is my question. In, 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 do you, how do you compare DCBs, Dan? Do you or don't you? You know, there are people who say, listen, you can't really compare across trials. I'm one of them. Yeah, and, I agree. and there are people who say that, listen, you have, you know, five year data now with impact, which is pretty impressive. Why don't you go with the balloon that has the most data regardless of comparing? So how do you choose between DCBs? No, I agree. Th I don't think you can co compare across different trials. We don't know uh, for sure. Impact has good data. Lutonics registry, real world registry rather than Levant one, uh, definitely has better data. Uh, one of the things to consider, and for me in particular, when we talked about basal, if we come back to that for a second. Yeah, that'd be great. That's what I'm looking at the most. You know, what, is there a dose response to whether or not uh, if the mortality is affected or whatnot? As is the delivery different? If there's something with just like paclitaxel yes. between these DCBs that might be different. And I don't know for sure. I, it doesn't mean I'm going to shy away from anti-proliferative technology, but it's one of the things I'm looking towards. But but with the new meta-analysis meta that Vishal and uh, Sandeep and you talked about, we never we shouldn't glaze over that. Sure. Is is do we use a D DS here? I mean, a DCB here? Because the question I know I'm going to, and I believe <laughs> that if it was me, I'd want a DCB. But my question is, well, you know, what what are your guys' thoughts on that? I mean, you no, know, I mean, if, if you. It's a meta-analysis, it's got a lot of press. You know, a lot of patients know about it, obviously. So the issue here is, you know, what's the story? Ah, just as I thought. Well, All right, give me another wire, guys. Just as I thought. What, 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 yeah, give me a Spartacor. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that, guys? I guess it's hard to base your decision on just one meta-analysis, really, and change your practice. I mean, I would not do that unless it's a big randomized trial, like a game changer which you have which we rarely i mean which we do have but not this one this is merely a based on the data and the meta-analysis i'm sure it's all the number games which also play a part so probably need some uh, further evaluation to it and see how like sit down look closely at the confounding factors and see if it really is playing a part or is just an incidental finding which we have on the side yeah, I, agree. You know, I think, I think this is probably where to consider it the most i mean like so for this kind of patient who has failed uh, bypass, who's got borderline rest pain, I think kind of using the best technology for sure that we have Ready available uh, is balloon. worthwhile. But, but what about the clodokin that you're doing in an outpatient setting? Like now with current data, what does that mean we're still going to be using DCB yeah, data? I don't think it'll uh, Anti-proliferative technology. Uh, Sorry, Sandy, if I cut you off, I think. No, no, no that's no, a great uh, question. I think, uh, you know, before discounting a therapy Maybe which real? has evolved over the last uh, five to seven years and it's been big use, I would definitely like to evaluate a patient level data. You know, what, uh, like, a, I understand it's a meta analysis, but they should, I think they did not do a, pas a patient level uh, analysis. Uh, like, they no. should get a data of patient by give patient. Give me, give me a new. And me. then analyze what caused this. Let's uh, capture the filter you know, here, guys. What caused this uh, trend. Then, if that is significant and then what caused it, then, you know, we have to do what we have to do. Mm -hmm. Then we can go from there on. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to have to capture the filter here. Because of uh, what Dan suggest, what Dan so rightly said is because we have a uh, a balloon that's not going to cross, so we're going to go ahead and capture the filter, yep. and then we're going to we're going to transfer it out for a uh, 035 wire, and then and then we're going to go ahead and do the DCB. I'm sorry, I feel like I jinxed you with my comment. No, <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. I, I think we should. I wish we had the 018. You know. You want to try a steel core wire? I don't yeah. think it'll matter. It was really really tight, and I even pushed the sheet down across my iliac. Look at my pressure. Wait, I can't capture the filter with this. I need a vert tip catheter. Yeah. So I'm going to capture the filter with the vert tip and just transfer out and save a step. So I think that, uh, so the question now would be, get me another uh, 250, please. So, so I, I, th I think what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead, capture this, and then we're going to go ahead and do uh, prolonged balloon angioplasty and then take a picture. 
So, so uh, do you use, let me ask Dan and you, do you use a pre-DCB balloon to prep up the, because do you use DCB primarily for drug delivery or you use it both as a PTA and a drug delivery? Or does it matter? So I always pre-balloon if I'm going to be using it as primary therapy, um, mainly because also yep. w uh, with low pressure in the beginning, it helps me. So we talked about how I size these vessels. So my primary balloon is also a good indicator for you know how I'm going to size the balloon afterwards. So I'm a little bit less aggressive about how big I choose there. But in the settings of uh, ath uh, if I atherectomy the vessel, then I believe that I've done essentially the same thing that the pre-ballooning is intended to do, which is take away some of the intima, expose that kind of media layer but where well, you okay, really want to deliver the drug. Okay, out, so, so I don't after atherectomy. Oh, okay. Next up. What about you, Vishal? No, I, I mean, I do the same thing. I do a pre drill balloon. I expand the vessel up and I use my DCB mainly for drug delivery. But then again, it's an extra step to take care of and sizing-wise, yeah, I mainly know how it is. But and I think yeah. it especially mm -hmm. helps with a calcified vessel. Right. You know, sometimes the, yeah. like the difficulty we have now and this was not even that heavily calcified, but in calcified vessels, then one, it gives an idea. Second, it gives you an idea about the possibility of the, you Thank know, especially you. the impact balloon is, uh, has a very uh, heavy profile, you know, and that's kind of a difference, you know, Dr. Cumming. Cycle of cuff, guys. Uh, choosing between the DCBs, I think Stellar X, you know, crossing profile and, uh, you know, the data for the calcium. So kind of, you know, that's where... Uh, and that's the other question. That's a great point. I mean, this guy is obviously calcified. Right. I mean, why not use his Telrex? I know, I know we don't have the lens, and that's why I'm not using it. But the point is, why not use his Telrex? Well, why not? I guess it's the same argument. So for core. Of cross well, stock. Is you know, well, we, we, know, we know that the impact balloon doesn't cross. Yeah. I mean, Medtronic can weave all the tails <laughs> they want. It, it, it's, the, it's a ridiculously bad balloon. Uh, you know, and, and I think I that, uh, that. no, <laughs> I'm talking about in profile. I'm not talking about in performance. And performance yes. is probably, arguably, the best balloon. Yes. But I'm talking about in, 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 in profile, you know, these kind of cases are long to begin with. And then, and then you're dealing with, you know, this kind of nonsense balloon, which, which really bothers you as well, right? I mean, the best thing, if you can't cross, just blame the fellow. Why is the pressure no. dropping? <laughs> All right, give me back. It's just touch. a sheet, I think. Is it? Yeah, I'm just going to pull back. Yeah, well, it's gone from like 150 to 120, and we're just kind of watching. I'm going to have to stent that iliac. I pulled the sheet back again. Yeah, it's pretty tight. Yeah, it is. Wow. Pretty impressive. And, you know, uh, just to finish, uh, like I was thinking about uh, what Asma, the data presented uh, from Dr. Zeller's group. There was a smaller subset. I don't remember the number, you know, when they reviewed it last year. When they did direction of the atherectomy followed by PTA, yes. they had a much better potency uh, as compared to a plain PTA. The, uh, the need for bailout stenting was lower. And I think there was another paper from uh, Dr. Tarsello's group. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but they did uh, direction of the atherectomy plus DCB versus only DCB, DCB for C CFA. And uh, direction of the atherectomy definitely gave a benefit. For what are we talking about now? For the CFA. CFA. You know, just to finish oh, uh, the we uh, asthma song. Still not going. It's still not going. Wow. All right. Need to pre dilate it? All right. You're going to have to pre dilate. Walk, walk it back. Show me above. I think it's your entry point lesion right yeah. there. Yeah. The sheath came back. I think that's what also is. OK, walk it out now. Mm. Yeah, give me a 5 0 uh, long um, uh, 035 balloon. It's annoying. Could this have anything to do with the surgical site? Uh, might be. Might right, be. You know, because. Right where they uh, tried Right where it seems to be getting exactly. stuck. Right. Yeah. But you know, when the directional atherectomy, give me a 5 0 long balloon, please. When the directional atherectomy seems to be going, why yeah. wouldn't a, a 035 uh, balloon go? I mean, to me, it's ridiculous. You know? Yes, Andy, why do you have to blame the surgeons? No, <laughs> <laughs> no because, you know, uh, there was one case we did last year uh, where there was a, they tied up the native vessel. And, uh, but is that a See, he's blaming the surgeon uh, again. Like, uh, <laughs> You know, it's probably, actually, this is probably, PK alluded to it, but this Hawk 1, uh -huh. um, they track beautifully. And yeah. you saw how the whole Hawk, Hawk right. 1 atherectomy device yeah. tracked all the way down. And to think that, you know, the, the balloon doesn't track after it kind of is a... Uh, yeah, it's, it's annoying. It's a, it might not even be that the balloon is terrible. It might just be that the Hawk is really good. Ah, <laughs> you're a positive guy. <laughs> so, you know, but then the other old 35 wire <laughs> flies, you know. I mean, give me a break. Yeah. It's so annoying. Show me a little lower. I think to me, Dan, I think that, you know, you know, we need to as endovascular folk 
need to start. Yeah, virus yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I'm just trying to be aggressive here. It's annoying. It, we need to start being aggressive with 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 the companies. I mean, they're they're giving us products that are that are inferior compared. I mean, in the coronary world, I mean, these people just go ahead and just do things, you know, with amazing, uh, you know, balloon technology and other things. And we have these trucks that they give us, you know, and I don't blame them. I mean, and the bottom line is, you know, I, part of the R&D and everything is important. Ray, fix my sheet, please. Start from the council. Even the puppet deals with this one. Wow. Yeah, That's a lot of pushing. Yeah. I think you have to watch your sheet. I know, I know. I'm just trying to be real aggressive here. It just, it's, I'm just scared about the sheet part. But I'm scared about my iliac, too. Yeah, that looks fine. All right, let's just go up here for now. Okay. Uh, then any experience with large bore access through stented CFAs? Large bore access through uh, stented CFAs? Yeah. Uh, uh, like, you know, uh, the more you know, the data Bigger. coming out for stand, sure. uh, you know, what's going to happen is in community, people are going to stand it, and then there's going to be a cohort of population requiring, you know, procedures sure. who will have stented CFAs. Any experience sure. uh, yeah. with that? I don't have experience with that, but the kind of, if you think about what the large bore access percutaneous pre-closes are doing, mm -hmm. you're anticipating and you're hoping for kind of the the wires to now cinch down the, the hole that you stretched out in the stent yeah. lattices. Right. I, you know, I, I can't, uh, you know Where's whether or not the whether or not the uh, where is it? This oh my god! What did I do? Cool. It's all the way down in the foot. <laughs> I ballooned the freaking I don't know what Ooh. I ballooned. Ah oh, Jesus! All right, let's see what we, what disaster we've crossed no, here. No, it's okay. There were some popliteal lesions. Hold yeah, on. we'll take a look now. All right, let's so short it. answers, Andy. I have no idea, oh, okay. but I could no, see no. I could see no, it being no, a no. I could see it being like kind of complicated for sure. Got it. We've, we've got issues. So uh, the balloon from migrated into the pop, we'll and I think fine. we ballooned the pop. I don't know. We'll see. It was a 6-0, so you'll have a very big, uh, either a very big pop or we'll have a very big issue in a second. But we'll take a look. I think it will be fine. So this is your plain old, just regular balloon, man. Dweller? Yeah. No dweller. No okay, dweller. good. We'll take a look now. All right, give me a um, coverage tank, guys. Have it ready. It's always fun to have fun things happen live, right? It's not so bad. It's it not so bad. Fire. We'll be okay. So you have to blame the DCB for all this. Ask him where? Ask him where Damien is tied. Okay. Okay. So have you ever done that, Dan? I've, d I've done that once where I took an 035 balloon into the tibial and uh, ballooned the tibial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like it's some of the, the dots on some of the balloons are less visible. Well, this you one I think one. We, you know this one I think was a classic, you know, rush. I think it was just not watching. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. I was expanding well. It looks fine. It's just we have to probably cross that lesion right there. Well, the problem was we went up with it. Asma went up with it, was having trouble seeing it. And I think that, that so I don't know where we were in the tibial at that stage. But we didn't walk it back, did we? I don't think so. So let's see. Feel the calf for me, Ray? So in these kind of cases, what you have to do is, if you perf, what's going to happen is you're going to have filling of the of the of the of the compartment, and then what you're going to have is you're going to have uh, basically uh, tenderness in the calf when raised. So it's always good to scrub out, get an idea of the softness of the calf, and get an understanding of where you're standing before you go down with the balloon. You know, it's tight. No, that's fine. Okay, so we'll see you in a second. So now that we've uh, done this, you know, we'll take a look. Well, it's off for now, right? <coughs> How high did you take DSA? the pressure? I, we went up. 
I went up to 10. Mm. All right, ready, DSA? Like a PP, MP2 level. Let's see if this looks right. Probably fine. Okay, inject. So it's always better to see than not to see. So basically, I shut my posterior tibial down, which is not the worst thing I could have done. So now we're going to go ahead and have to deal with this. So give me a, a vert tip uh, catheter, guys, and give me a, uh, um, give me a, um, um, a, a field of wire. So now at least the dorsalis pedis is robust. Yeah, you can see kind of <laughs> <laughs> better flow into that PT now. So once we get the PT back. All right, we'll, we'll get it back. So let's give me now a, um, uh, just a field of wire rail me, please. Put me on coronary array. So I mean, part of it is, you know, now you got to, that's, this actually illustrates the importance of your pre-angio, guys. So now I know what I had before and back and post. And I think, you know, this is kind of how we're going to fix this. So now, now that we know what's going on, now we're going to go ahead with the pre-angio, and we're going to have Ray put it up so I can see where the posterior tibial comes off. And this could be either through embolization, this kind of issue, you know, where, where the balloon is migrated down, and then you've gone ahead and ballooned a posterior tibial, you know. And luckily, we're lucky that we dissected and not not uh, not uh, ruptured this, yeah. you know. So I mean, we this is retrievable. And we'll get it hopefully with God willing. So I'm just looking at where the posterior tibial takes off. I'm going to freeze it there, and then you're going to put it up top. It's right around yeah. the 25 centimeter mark. So I'm going to I'm going to put it there. So and then we're 28 and we're, on an LA yeah. 25. So we're going to go right now, mag up now. So right around the 25. Looks like a very big vessel there, doesn't it? There, that's where it starts. I just don't like how that wire is behaving. Feels like I'm out in Hiroshima here. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, that's not good. I don't think that's the full thing. Yeah. Interesting. Kind of where it goes. Yeah, exactly. That's where the PD goes, but probably in a dissection plane more than. Probably in a huge dissection plane here. Give me a different wire, guys. Let me see whether I can withdraw some blood. Definitely getting blood back, which is a good sign. Give me a, uh, give me a, a, a confianza. Let's see whether we get any filling retrograde. Might be a good option. And I, I mean, I know this is not something we've both ever done. So the question is, how, uh, how do you, how would you deal with this? The same exact way that you're doing, patiently looking at your options, comparing it to what it looked like before. It's right there. We're in a bad dissection plane, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Okay. All right, ready? Mm-hmm. So you never want to leave this guy with the, with the less less than what he started. Obviously, you can see the perineal is is filling, but at other times you may also, if you haven't created a huge dissection or or created a perforation, you don't want to make it a perforation. So you have to also know when to cut your losses, you know. And I think in this situation, the perineal is filling, the anterior tibial is filling, the posterior tibial is not perforated. So why not cut your losses and come back to fight another day? Let this dissection heal. Follow him closely and then come back. That's another thought in my mind at this stage. Especially like, you know, if his foot fills from the deep, uh, from the AT. Yeah, which it will. The deep, yeah. uh, then, and if he's not having any acute pain or anything. No, no, he's co very yeah, comfortable, I think actually. that's a reasonable, very reasonable. So this is what I'm talking about here, we're waiting for. There. Yeah. Uh, no, it's still. Uh, that yeah. looks like we're, yeah, yeah. maybe, I don't know. It looks like a little bit. Yeah. It's looking good, but it's a very sharp wire. Yeah. It's going to go where it and wants to go. Which wire are you using? Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks yeah. like a dissection, yeah, but it's spiral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nope, it's spiraling. Yeah, it's spiral. 
Yeah. Give me a Toromo GT, please. Toromo. Actually, give me a, uh, not a figure, give me a Toromo. Give me a Toromo here. Well, I mean, not to make things more, I guess, more complicated, but if you really want to salvage the PT and if it doesn't get fixed this way, the last case before you plan to abort is probably get a PT access at the foot and try to see if you can connect the dot. I mean, it makes things more complicated, of course. I mean, it's But a, uh, you're right. If both the AT and the peroneal are going fine with good flow, uh, we yeah, we buy time and everything. And then well, I, I think that this will heal, obviously. It's a dissection that's right. going to heal. Yeah. It's just a question of, you know, you know what, what it looks like. I mean, you'd like to get across it, balloon it, evaluate it, and then decide. Put me on coronary, guys. So I'm going to pull it back up again and try again, try to find another plane. Show me higher. Thank you. Let me just come a little higher, like right there. The loop is always your friend, usually, but not here, obviously. You know, below the knee, you don't like to loop, but it's not unreasonable to want to loop. And that's where I think yeah. the balloon ended, so that's why it's probably. Uh, yeah, I just don't like the way that's uh, behaving. That's that looks better. Yeah, that looks fine. Um, Let's see. No, that's definitely. No, I'm definitely making this worse. Yeah. There. Uh, no. No. That's good. It's a branch. At least we think it's a branch. No, doesn't behave well. Let's pull back here. Let's try one more time. That looks a little better. Nope, same problem. We're same track. Same track. But I wish we could see some distal reconstitution, which I don't, you know. That would help me a lot. No. This, is, this is out in the middle of nowhere. Selective uh, short form. You could, but I, 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 you know, you want to see a little bit more yeah. sort of, yeah, well, you know. <coughs> what are your thoughts, Dan? LIA or what? Yeah, no, I think I would take another shot right at this point. Uh, okay, right there. I, I, That's mm -hmm. the I, I don't know if there was a lesion right at the start of the AT. Uh, I can't Let's take a look here, see one. what we're dealing see with. See what we got here. You may not like what we see, guys. Already? DSA? Yeah, 20 I mean that's what I'm leaning towards I think s for sure I think that looking at the PT there and how your wire was progressing you can certainly extend the dissection a lot we more distal bring, bring well the, the balloon cap. definitely was distal yeah. give me a give me a whisper wire here let's try with a whisper one last wire and then and then we'll just stent that uh, that TPT, huh? Yeah, it's uh, a TPT. Or even a long, prolonged balloon, yeah. you know, like something like a chocolate. Yeah, I agree. Like, uh, coming back with the catheter, because I think it's even the injection itself, yeah. it looks like the way, the, the balloon thing, it looks like there's a dissection there also. The other thing to do is just leave it alone, and then and you got the good for retrograde yeah. filling and, and see how he does. Yeah, exactly, document But I mean, I think that it's worthwhile to, if we retrieve the profunda here, to retrieve the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the TPT. Yeah, keep it but I don't want to place a stand across it because it's going to no. burn me yeah. coming back and helping him. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I would you just know? probably try to wire into the peroneal and at least get my uh, dissection plane type. You can see the dissection plane actually extends into the TP trunk. Yeah, you see it. So that's the whole thing now. At least if I have one out of two vessel outflow, it would be ideal. But again. Yep. But All that's right. an ideal situation. That's an ideal situation. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, put me on corner, guys. Obviously, this is unexpected. We should have been done by now, but let's see. Did we DCBD not yet, right? No, we didn't no, take a picture of the SFA. Yeah. We had to do one more DCB in the SFA, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
The question is, can we get into that perineal? That's going to be an issue, too. Yeah. That looks better. Show me down now. This is better. This is the vessel. Yeah, mm, that's the yeah. vessel. Now we're in the vessel. Yeah. Okay. Give me a uh, torque here, guys. Now I need a nice loop here to help me. There there. You go. Fantastic. That's yeah. now the D. There you go. All right. Now give me the uh, give me a balloon now. Give me a give me a long three O balloon. Long three O. Oh, two two, uh, two two five three O. Two five three O. Two five three O. Eight. Okay, DSA. So my question now is, I guess now you're into the PT. Uh, if you balloon the PT all the way extending to the TP, would you compromise the peroneal because of the dissection plane, or would you want to wire the peroneal as well and then do balloon? Well, uh, I think one or the other, right? Okay. No, just just a quest, I guess. Plus, you know, on the Something previous shot, lot. there was a collateral already coming off, a big collateral coming off the peroneal. I think that should be fine. You know, I think. Give me the the, no? the the Spartacore. So we're gonna balloon this and then and then reevaluate and then see what we can do. Two five three zero. Oh. So you know I think part of it is also being able to recognize what what you've done. Spartacore, please give me give me a Spartacore wire, guys. Spartacore wire, please. I think it's a great learning point of how sometimes complex lesions can be done easily and easy lesions take a little bit more complexity. Well, I think I think it's you know it's a, it's a, basically this is unfortunate because. You know, obviously the balloon, we were having so much trouble pushing the balloon. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, pushing the balloon made it, made it, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, balloon went further down than needed. Right. And you don't have me and Guja to blame anyways because we're both not in the room. So, well, Still actually, <laughs> actually, actually, you are here, aren't you? <laughs> now, this one, this one is on me. There's no question. It's all a part of the game. It's all good. Well, the, the whole point learning. is. You know, you don't give up. I mean, you exactly. have to recognize it. You have to fix it. You, you know, and this guy, you know, this is going to be fine. I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll take care of this. So the issue here is now, as we said, how is this going to react to balloon angioplasty? Well, you know, there's my catheter in the foot, right? And now I'm through the PT, and now we're going to go ahead and balloon it. Okay. Thank you, sir. That's Give me awesome. the 30. 3025 210. So, Dan, you're going to leave that AT, the osteal AT? Well, let's see how this looks, right? Okay. I think this is a, this, we're doing this because we got into issues. Or right, we've never right, done right. this. Right. Uh, Rail, and show me above, Ray. Well, again, it's another technique to identify if you have a dissection plane. Let's say it's for the dissection plane, even after just ballooning in the other segments or a smaller balloon. It's always good to try different wires, techniques, angulations. You went That's down, stepped above. down from an 018 to an 014 wire, more hydrophilic wire. Well, so. you know, it, it's also the, the whole situation. I don't want to come across AT. Give me a little die here. So it's very important now not to comp, uh, you know, comp, you know, make it double worse because you don't want to come across your AT here. Right. So you want to make sure you're more. below your AT, right? So I'm going to come even a little further down right there. And we're going to go up. <coughs> okay, negative. And go up. Mm -hmm. Keep going. See, that's your proximal segment, and that's exactly 10. where it was, where it dissected. Okay, 10. Okay. Yep, 10 atmospheres. That's nominal. Very good. Let's, again, the wire came back, uh, but we're okay. So we'll balloon this for a little bit. So, Dan, when do you, now this is a great point. Now, now let's talk about standing below the knee. We're basically doing a master class in endo here. Yeah, so, absolutely. A little bit so, of everything. Yeah, a little bit of everything. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of standing below the knee, I mean, here you have a patient who's a claudicant. Obviously, this is unexpected, but say this was part of the procedure where you had multi-level disease with no vessel runoff, and uh, you've got through your SFA, and now you've got no vessel runoff. 
say you have a osteo, uh, you know, posterior tibial that's 99%. Would, do you fix that or don't you fix that or you just leave it with the inflow? I think you fix that and I think short segment kind of drug eluted stents right at Heart the origins rotate. of the tibial uh, yeah. origins. I think they, they do very well. The problem is like when you get down to the middle or distal or longer segment uh, tibial vessels, like you don't, we don't really, like putting in multiple, you know, uh, coronary stents into the tibials has never been that attractive. But uh, I think alluvia below the knee is supposed to be on the way. Well, so well it is actually, yeah. it's, uh, I, think, I think they're starting and also you have the DCB below the knee. What, so uh, some, uh, Sandeep, what are your thoughts on DCB below the knee? Vishal, <laughs> what are your thoughts? So, oh, go ahead. No, go, talk. So, uh, you know, the initial uh, data was not uh, in favor. The impact deep is what we have uh, historically always quoted. Stop it. But then, you know, we got this we uh, back, uh, trial, the Latonics below the knee uh, data, I'm which was uh, presented at uh, yeah, Viva, uh, the past Viva. And, you know, it's uh, at least, the I think the take home from look. that are, uh, there was no, sa the uh, safety concern was addressed, if not the potency concern. And uh, I, I forgot, it's a 12 month data. Right. Uh, so six months data. Six and months. Six, six months. months data. And the potency was decent. I think 70% potency. Yeah. So, but remember, but the PTA arm did really well. Uh, yes. There was no difference. There was right. no difference in amputation as well, yes. which makes you think, well, what, you know, what, what are we doing here if yeah. there's no difference in amputation, you know? Yeah. But you know the only thing you know to uh, the, uh, the one take home between impact deep and this was the safety concern was addressed. They didn't right. have higher amputation, so I would still wait for a longer duration. You know, but somebody can argue, but you know uh, that in a CLI patient, if I'm using this uh, 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 Latonics below the knee therapy, then you are essentially looking for the first three to six month potency. That's when the wound's gonna heal. Right. But you, somebody can argue, yes, counter argue that you know if the PTA is giving me the same potency, similar potency, why why would I go to why would I go to belonging uh, right. DCP therapy? I think it's just we were hoping for a better yes. and more robust yeah, more, result. We wanted a more yeah. uh, absolute difference. Right. But I guess happen. it yeah. didn't happen. And Sandeep is absolutely right. The concern, at least, that we are not causing any more harm, yeah. probably saved the day for the DCB Leave to it. give it another day to have a better trial and have yeah, a better dissection. outcome, hopefully. Yeah. Leave it. Oh, it looks good, yeah, though. It looks well, good. so you know, so now you've got the TPT, you've got the perineal back, you've got the AT back, you've got a distal perineal or TPT dissection. But again, yes. your perineal is robust. Yeah. We're going to leave it. Yeah, that will heal. Um, it's and good. we're not going to we're not going to bother. Yeah. Which, again, so. and then when we talk about you know, I know we see the AT origin lesion, but we talk about why we're here. You know, the, the whole reason that we were here in the beginning was a patient who has a claudicum borderline rest pain. So the goal, the reason we're treating the PT here is because we wanted to restore him to what he was before at the start of the case. Exactly. And make sure that we restore that anatomy, but aggressively chasing after the AT. And this particular patient probably not necessary. And here's the AT coming in slowly, as we thought, but the posterior tibial is robust flow, and definitely the AT will, will, will become robust as, as we uh, fi finish fixing the SFA. You can see there's great flow into the foot via the AT now, or the DP. So now we're just going to look at the SFA, two shots, and then we're going to stop, uh, come offline, and then we're going to go ahead and fix it because we're about 30 minutes above where we, sh where we should have stopped. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, and that's what we, we took. So we did DCB of the distal... Um, you know, SFA, we got to do DCB of the ostium, I believe, now. And, um, and I think, let me just take a picture, and we'll just have a little discussion with Dan before we uh, let him go. I'm sure he has a busy day. But I think this case was so informative. So this look, so Dan, what do you think about that distal yeah, dissection yeah. there? Yeah, I think uh, there's a non-flow limiting dissection in the area, a little AV fistula that comes in a little bit late. So uh, we leave that. I definitely think I right. will leave that. And then osteally. And the profunda wise will make a decision, but we did, we did balloon it with a regular balloon. Oh, oh, oh. that looks beautiful, yeah, but the dissection is expensive. The dissection looks bad, but the yeah. vessel looks beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what do you think? Yeah, I think you did the prolonged ECB up top. Yep. Check it again. But, but more importantly, look at the profunda. Absolutely. Profunda looks fine, great Absolutely. flow in the profunda. And I think we're just gonna, we're gonna prolong the uh, balloon this and then possibly provisionally stent it in the ostium. 
and then we're, we're gonna we're gonna end this case and treat awesome. the iliac on the way out and treat the iliac on the way out so we we did pretty much uh you know whole leg angioplasty here but i really want to thank dr hani i mean oh, he gave up you. two hours of his time i really appreciate it very very much i think i thought this was a great uh do a dcp ostomy i thought this is a great uh you know case that showed all the decision making dan of the profunda of the common femoral and then we got a complication to boot to show and how to get out of that so i i and but most importantly i think the points that i want you to emphasize to our audience is these dissections, you know, cardiologists are like stent, even probably radiologists are like stent the dissection and get out. I mean, what? I mean, you you wait and see, right? You've got the drug on board. Absolutely, I think you know, um, a lot of the times now with drug coated balloon technology, anti proliferative technology, the idea is that these vessels will repair themselves. To go after every little angiographic tick that you see on the screen often kind of leads you to treat too much, and ev with every kind of treatment, even a simple balloon or any kind of delivery you could see is fraught with potential complications from whether it be a technical mistake or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So kind of a lot of the times doing less is more. I mean, knowing when to stop is definitely important. Now these need to be followed, kind of an ultrasound. That's exactly the point. Very early yep. uh, in this patient. So within, uh, definitely within a month, maybe w even within two weeks, getting an ultrasound to see what's doing in terms of flow limitation. Uh, is we'll definitely get an ultrasound within two weeks. But as far as antiplatelet, do you, would you add an antithrombotic to him with all of what's going on? I don't think so. I think no? dual antiplatelet therapy is what I would go for this particular patient. Um, and yeah. take it from there. Yeah. Well, again, I'm going to sign off from here. We thank Dan, obviously, for taking his time. Dr. Han, for taking his time. He's available at daniel.han at mountsinai.org for any questions or comments. And obviously, you can email us about this case, and we'll send you photos on the, on the outcome of this case and how it ends up. Uh, you know, but I really appreciate all of you for signing in, and thanks for your patience. And we will see you next year, and a happy holidays and a happy new year. Happy holidays. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, PK. Thank you, uh, Dan, for an amazing case. Great learning, great opportunity to see different uh, issues, how to tackle them, how to approach, and when to get out, bail out, and say, okay, enough is enough. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we wish you all from our family here at Sinai to your family a very happy new year, happy holidays. Uh, we'll see you next year, starting January 23rd, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time from Mount Sinai. Till then, enjoy the rest of the holidays. Happy holidays.